And just as you have your fingers on the page there, uh, let me introduce this for us this morning. This morning I want us to think about something we may not have paid much attention to, uh, something that we may not have connected with church life or the Bible much before, uh, something called friendships. Friendships. Uh, one of our favorite uh, British murder mysteries is McDonald and Dodds. Uh, but the show captures one struggle of friendship very well. During one of their many investigations, the older gentleman, Sergeant Dodds, explains why he doesn't see many of his older friends as much as he'd like. He said, when men get to my time of life, they isolate themselves, you know, socially. His younger colleague is obviously thrown by this comment and quickly moves to change the subject. But there's a certain sadness in that scene of an older gentleman struggling to find friendship in later life. So as we think about friendships, I know that there are people who are naturals at developing friendships. They just seem to be able to befriend nearly everyone that they meet. For others, friendship takes a little bit more effort. And there are even some of us where talk of friendship is a very sensitive subject because of the hurts we've experienced in past friendships broken. All this to say, as we Think about friendships this morning. I want us to think about friendships in biblical terms. As we'll discover, our passage highlights traits and aspects of a good friendship and gives us clues for developing and maintaining healthy friendships in a Christian life. So let's come to these words of God. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Our God and Father, as we give our attention to these words, I pray that you would teach us, that you would be our true teacher, and that we would make sound application of what we find here. We ask this, Father, that we might glorify Christ not only in the way that we have come to worship, but in the way we go from here and in the way we befriend one another. For Christ's sake, amen. So what's interesting here is that verse one really sets the stage of a truly good biblical friendship. As we read it in the ESV, it simply says the beloved Gaius. The beloved Gaius. And that certainly is accurate. That certainly is reflected in the Greek. But, but though we, we sometimes tend to think when the Bible uses words like beloved, we think it's just being a little bit gushy, a little bit soppy, just an embellishment. But mere sentimentality is really at the heart of it. That's not what the word beloved means here. So let's not gloss over it too quickly. There is a depth of meaning to the word beloved that I want us to lock onto if the rest of this sermon is going to make any sense at all. As we look at other English translations, and this is often helpful to do if you don't have access to original languages, look at the way at the uh, the text being translated in other English translations. The other English translations attempt to draw out this meaning of the word beloved a little bit further. 
Some translate beloved Gaius as my good friend Gaius. Or my dear brother. Or perhaps most accurately, my dear friend. My dear friend Gaius. We have to lock on to this because Gaius was more than just a mere friendly acquaintance to the author. Gaius, as our various translations try to show us, was actually a close friend. A very close friend. And the author explicitly draws attention to this quality of this close friendship that he had by adding the beloved Gaius whom I love. My dear, beloved friend Gaius, whom I love. The question is, how did Gaius and the Apostle John, who wrote this letter, develop such a remarkable friendship that they could speak so openly about their friendship, so closely about their friendship? As we think about that question, we also want to ask ourselves this morning, how could we think about Developing friendships of which we are able to say so spontaneously that I love that person. I love that friend. I'm going to suggest to you there are at least three aspects to developing and maintaining rich and meaningful friendships in Christian life. There are at least three aspects to it that we can find here in verses 1 through to 4. They all come in pairs. Three aspects, but they all come in pairs. The first pair, which is key to developing a meaningful friendship, is the pairing of love and truth. This is not an either-or issue. This is not a... um, This is not multi-choice. This isn't a thing where you get to choose which part of this you want to apply to friendship, whether you want to apply love or whether you want to apply truth. We need to invest both love and truth in order to develop biblically healthy friendships. You probably know this from experience already. It's probably come up in your own friendships. I can think of some friendships that seem incapable of deepening, and I know exactly why. It's because the friendship is trying to hobble along on one leg, the leg of truth, but lacking genuine love. These friendships, just from my experience, tend to be informationally rich friendships, but they are relationally Poor. They are information rich, but relationally poor. These friendships are capable of talking into all hours of the night about some theological doctrine or some political maneuverings around the globe, but they lack meaningful capacity to talk on a more personal level. Like we can talk about everything under the sun for long. But what we can't talk about are personal things. How's your heart? What's the Lord been teaching you? On the flip side, some of our relationships never deepen because they hobble along on the other leg. They hobble along on the leg of affirmative love but they show a surprising lack of concern with truth. As a consequence, these friendships tend to lack a meaningful contribution, a meaningful commitment to one another's spiritual formation and maturity and obedience to Christ. These kinds of friendships just want to tell you everything is okay all the time, but they will never go the extra mile to challenge us to help us grow in a particular area, 
to help us think about something that we may have gotten wrong, that we need to re-evaluate um, in light of the scriptures. In this regard, Timothy Keller has made this most excellent observation that love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but it keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. And yet, for all that said, between the Apostle John and Gaius, we see a balanced investment of both truth and love in their friendship. And that's certainly one aspect of developing a deep and stable and yet desirable friendship. The kind of friendship that could reach the point where you could um, say to someone else, I really love that person. I really love them as a friend. So let's make note of this. Whether we're just new to developing friendships or we're looking to improve the friendships that already exist, this much is key. This much is key. In committing to a friendship, we need room for both truth and love. This, after all, is the shape that the gospel gives our friendships. It is the way in which Jesus himself befriends us. Jesus is radically committed to, our, uh, to love us, he is radically committed to love us, but he is also radically committed to truth in the way that he befriends us because he won't sugarcoat our sins. He is radically committed to us in truth because he is unconditionally committed to us in truth, but he is also radically committed to truth because he won't sugarcoat our sins. As Timothy Keller said it once more, God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are and yet also radical, unconditional uh, commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. We need both. We need both truth and love in our friendships. And this is really just another way of saying that we want our friendships to be formed in a gospel shaped way. We want the gospel to be the thing that shapes our friendships also. Not just a doctrine for us to believe, but something that actually teaches us how to do life. As we move out of verse 1 then and into the following three verses, there are at least two more aspects of developing and maintaining meaningful friendships in the Christian life. The second thing we see is that meaningful friendships show care about each other's physical as well as spiritual well-being. Note this in verse 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So the first aspect to, a, to developing and maintaining healthy Christian friendships is truth and love together. And now we're also adding dimensions of an interest in each other's spiritual as well as physical well-being. The question is, how often do we actually sabotage the prospects of a deepening friendship because of our neglect to tend to one another's physical or spiritual health. When we neglect it, we actually sabotage our friendships, don't we? We know this from experience. Some of the, our friendships stagnate at the level of physical concern. How's your health? 
How's your kids' health? Have you been getting enough sleep? These are good questions to ask. They're legitimate questions to ask. They're even the right question to ask in a friendship. In fact, some of my closest friends, take a, when they take a genuine interest in my physical well-being, I am profoundly grateful that they have asked those questions of me. But I am grateful because I know this is not their only concern. I know this isn't the, um, the depths of our friendship. But a physical well-being, conversations about the weather, our jobs, our holiday plans, our health updates, if that was the only thing we could talk about, the capacity for depth in friendship is often hindered. You know this. The friends that you are closest to are not the friends that you only talk about the weather about, right? If we're only... Uh, if we hamstring ourselves at the level of only showing a physical concern, we are hindering our friendships. As important as these physical things are, and they really are important, John, after all, truly expresses a genuine interest in the physical well-being of Gaius. He, is re he thinks that it matters to ask about Gaius' health. Physical stuff matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. John knows that the conversation has to go deeper, that he can't just restrict the friendship to the level of talking about physical concerns only. So helpfully, John shows us that it is super normal, it is as normal as the sky being blue for healthy friendships to wade into conversations about spiritual well-being also. It's okay to talk with your friends about things about God. It's okay to ask them what they're thinking about God, what they've been reading in their Bibles or what other helpful book they may have been reading lately or how they're making sense of a world what they believe about Christ's triumph over all evil. It's okay to talk about things like that. You note this in verse 2 also, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. John is the kind of friend that will talk about things going well with your soul. That is to say, John and Gaius have developed a well-balanced friendship with open conversation where they could talk about anything, where, they, where nothing was off the table. They could talk about their stubbed toes and they can talk about their stubborn hearts. They could talk about the thrills of driving in sickly overpowered V8 but they could talk about their new steps of maturity in Christ also. It was all there. All of it was on the table. They could talk about everything. Nothing was off the table. It's all there, isn't it? That's how we develop these meaningful and lasting friendships in Christian life. Where we commit to one another and both our physical and spiritual well-being. It's the third aspect about developing and maintaining healthy Christian friendships. The third aspect is this, is that friendships require us to be giving and receiving. Friendships require a gift as well as receiving. Verses 3 and 4 teaches us this. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. 
Notice what John and Gaius were giving and receiving in this friendship. They were giving and receiving affirmation. Affirmation of the gospel, making a real difference to the shape and direction of their lives. When they heard about the gospel making this impact on each other's lives, they rejoiced, they were happy about it. John said, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified that you are walking in the truth. You know, in that statement, John was receiving affirmation of, their, of his friendship with Gaius. He was receiving the affirmation that the gospel was central to Gaius' life. That the gospel had made an unmistakable imprint upon Gaius' life. And you know this, friendship with people like that, people who are gravitating towards the gospel in everything that they do, friendship with those people are immensely attractive. Immensely attractive. Certainly in my Christian life, the friendships which have endured, in spite of often great geographical and even age differences, are those in which we are able to point out the ways in which the gospel continues to shape and renew our lives. The good friendships are those that we are able to look through the window, as it were, and say, wow, it's amazing what God's doing with you. It's amazing what God has done with you these last 10 years. It's amazing what he has taught you this past month. One such friend of mine is a much, much older man than I am. He must be ticking on about 80 years by now, I think. But he is a true and a dear friend. About a month ago, someone mentioned to me how they saw him recently and how he continues to serve his family and his local church community. And just hearing it, just hearing that this man who is pressing on in years continues to be fruitful continues to love the Lord, continues to esteem the gospel. Just hearing that he was walking in the truth, to borrow words from John, it did me a great deal of good. It reminded me of how good our friendship is. And this is the kind of giving and receiving of affirmation that John was talking about here. He had heard from others. Other people came to him and said how his dearly beloved friend Gaius was evidently orientated toward the gospel and that he was living in the light thereof. The gift and the receiving of affirmation that the gospel is making lasting impact is good for your friendships. Sadly, also, some of the greatest pains in friendship, in my life at least, hasn't come from friends who challenge my sin, as often I don't even want to hear them. It doesn't even come from friendships that seem to, bit, to hit a bit of a rough patch every now and again. No, my greatest pains in friendship over the years have come from hearing once gospel-motivated friends Deserting their love for Christ and his church. Those friendships, those stories of the gospel no longer making meaningful difference, having a meaningful influence, shape or focus upon someone else's life. They have honestly been some of the most painful experiences I've ever known of. And friendships lost. But we're stating the point positively here, aren't we? Like John states the point positively. 
Gospel friendships are developed and maintained when friends give and receive affirmation of the gospel's impact on one another's lives. Indeed, this is why John wrote that he rejoiced. He rejoiced when he heard that Gaius was walking in the truth. It really, truly was a meaningful joy to him. As he says elsewhere, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So this morning then, we've taken a bit of a basic look at some of the aspects to developing and maintaining meaningful friendships in the Christian life. Through the friendship John shared with Gaius, we have seen that healthy friendships require love and truth, they require physical and spiritual care, and they require giving and receiving of gospel affirmation. These things matter if you're looking to build friendships which will endure. If this is true, perhaps then it's time that we assess our own friendships, even our disappointments in friendships. And remember, Jesus too experienced disappointments in friendships. Jesus knew what it was like to have a close friend turn their backs on him. To, know, to have someone in the inner circle, as it were, walk away from the faith. Judas, right? A close friend. One of the 12 that Jesus loved most dearly. And as we think about assessing our own friendships, we also want to think about the steps we might take to cultivate the kind of friendships that we really need. The kind of friendships the Bible show us to be truly meaningful. To be sure, as Sam Storm helpfully reminds us, not everyone is a candidate to be a friend. Not everyone is a candidate to be your friend. Some people prove themselves untrustworthy, routinely so. Some still lack the graces in which the necessary trust for meaningful friendship can be built. So not everyone can be your closest friend. And that's fine. That's fine. It's okay to step into a church and realize that not everyone is going to be your closest friend. Even Jesus did not try to befriend everybody. Remember this. Not even Jesus tried to befriend everybody equally. He loved everybody, but he only befriended a few. Twelve. And from that twelve, he befriended three of them more closely than the others. So you can love everybody, but you can't befriend everybody. That's one of our limitations as human beings, right? But we must then think about those who we will befriend, those whom we will be friends with, those who we will most intimately befriend will know something of Jesus' own commitments and friendship, that Jesus himself was committed to love his friends and to be truthful with his friends. To know that Jesus was concerned with their physical well-being as well as their spiritual well-being. And that Jesus was delighted with the evidence of the Gospels shaping and renewing their lives. This is to say the most intimate friendships we will establish will surely have echoes of Jesus' friendship with his disciples.